Okay, so folks, we have come to that point, the last lecture for the keynotes, and I'm particularly excited because uh, this is one of my favorite topics. And for those of you who have figured this out already, we have a module on wetlands and livelihoods in module six that you, you know that is specific to that. So wetlands is a topic that's core to my heart. And uh, I don't know how many of you know about the East Kolkata wetlands, which we will talk about, but I grew up understanding how, very close to my house, communities were managing an incredible ecosystem by converting the sewage of the city into food and fish and subsidizing urban habitats using their own knowledge systems. So that's how I got into wetlands. And that is why it is so nice, of course, for us to have Dr. Musonda Mumba to talk to us today. And to talk about Musonda's accomplishments would take a lecture class by itself, but I'll try to keep it as brief as possible, which may not be fair, but bear with me. Dr. Musonda Mumba is a wetland ecologist with a PhD from University College London, and currently the Secretary General of the Convention of the Wetlands based in Plan, Switzerland. She has over 25 years experience of working in the multilateral space with both the United Nations, UNEP and UNDP, and the conservation organization Worldwide Fund for Nature, focusing on climate change, water resource management, gender, sustainable development, integrated landscape management with a passion for systems thinking. In her current role, she provides strategic support to 172 contracting parties from across the world. She is also the founder of the Network of African Women Environmentalists, and she has received numerous accolades for her work, including being named one of the 100 most influential African women. On International Women's Day 2022, she was honored by the Global Landscape Forum as one of the 16 women from around the world restoring the planet. Musanda, it's an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind interview. And um, I'm really, really deeply honored to be here. And, and thank you so much, Anne and, and the team at, at Delft. And really, congratulations, all of you, for joining this exciting and amazing master's class. And uh, really great to see you here. So um, when I arrived yesterday, I saw in the news, and what we see many times in the news, there's going to be a storm. and. It's going to be, you know, it's hurricane type winds, etc. And what we do see in a lot of our news are news stories of is it flooding? Is it what exactly is happening? And a lot of news around what is very much wetland related. And so you may, I may, you know, ask the question, what are wetlands? And I'm sure you all know what wetlands are. And I will not bore you. Since you're in IHE, I will not bore you what these systems are, but really in the definition of our convention, it's really those pretty self-explanatory, you know, land that can be actually, uh, you know, intermittent in formation. So the extent varies depending on the time. We have permanent and, and, and um, standing water spaces, coastal wetlands, and many of which, wherever you're coming from, Sudan, Indonesia, Kenya, Zambia, I don't know, but there is a wetland system that somehow you've interacted with one day or the other. Now, for many instances, these have been equated to as wetlands. You just dump stuff there. It's behind the building, just dump things in there. Somehow, 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 it's going to figure itself out. That's how they've been seen for many years and for many spaces in the world. And as a result, because of how they've been seen and, and viewed, what you begin to see is that their loss is very eminent and very prominent. So we have lost over 35% of wetland systems since um, a good you know, many years, uh, over 50 years plus. And also we're still losing more and we're also losing species, but also wetland systems are disappearing three times more than uh, uh, forest ecosystems. Globally, 80% of West water, and, and Amit, you were just talking about where you grew up, gets released into wetlands. 
I saw this in, in many places, you know, the city of Kampala, for example, is an example in Uganda. Most of the sewage water or Lake Naivasha, which is also a Ramses site, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Also, most of the sewage just goes into the lake. So we tend to use these wetland systems really to just somehow filter and sort out our, mm, I will not use that word, but with, it, with this, I mean, it really has to stop. And we're beginning to see why the implications are very serious. So why do these systems matter and why are they important? Um, of course we know. I mean, you're living in Delft, you're living in the Netherlands. And I, and I think Redanta did allude to that in terms of, you know, why these freshwater systems and other wetland systems matter and why they're valuable. And that is pretty much self-explanatory, the water cycle which we see now getting very much disrupted, removing harmful waste, and also the element of insecurity in places that have extreme, you know, uh, droughts. Why are they important? Also the element of land use. You know, we've seen how some of the drivers, agriculture is the largest driver of wetland loss all over the world, everywhere, global north and global south. And the same wetlands also very much are related to our planetary dynamics, the climate, peatland systems, for example, uh, mangrove ecosystems are very, very much critical. So you're going to see a lot of discussions at COP28, if you're going to follow that process. What are they discussing? Why does this matter? How much carbon is actually being released because of degradation from wetland ecosystems? the stopping and reversing of wetland loss, and why is that critical to the Paris Agreement? Because now the world is discussing what should we stop. The story of lithium, and I'm going to allude a little bit to that, um, and most of the lithium gets extracted out of wetland systems. Um, in fact, for a ton of lithium, you need a good 4 million uh, tons of water. So it's very perverse, but really we have to understand the value of these ecosystems. But in planetary terms, this is what they do. They sustain our very existence. The drinking water that you were asking about, how much is enough? Are we getting clean water through our taps? The jobs, fisheries industry, many other elements, climate regulation from the mountains in the Himalayas and the Andes in the Alps. I live in Switzerland and I overlook the Mont Blanc and I walk every day and I remind my children those mountains is where some of the rivers are actually emerging. The biodiversity, some of the most biologically diverse spaces in the world are from wetland systems. I don't know how many of you read the story last year. If you can Google it, there was a, a, a bar-tailed godwit bird that flew 13,000 kilometers from Alaska to Tasmania. From a wetland in Anchorage to a wetland in Tasmania. And for the bird to fly the 13,000 kilometer journey nonstop, it should have eaten some good fish, some good algae, energy field, and then it goes, wings out. Now that is what wetlands do, provide good food when it's not plastic. Food production, flood protection. Here in the Netherlands, the government of the Netherlands has also a philosophy which is referred to as giving back. There's a Dutch word, I think, giving back room, room for nature, exactly, room for water. Giving back to nature because we've taken a lot, we've taken away. So how do we manage this flood protection because our systems have been dependent on wetland systems for navigation? I also want to add something in here to say that most, if not all, civilizations have started around wetlands. The agriculture civilization of Babylon, what is today Iraq and Iran, the Iran marshes, is around wetland systems. And most of these wetlands have been managed by women. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Then this then brings me why a convention on wetlands. So in 1971, in a town called Ramsar, men and women met, and they said, we need 
to save these wetland ecosystems. The Convention on Wetlands is the oldest and most experienced multilateral environmental agreement. It's older than the Three Rio Conventions, the Climate Convention, it's older than the Biodiversity Convention, CBD, it's older than the Desertification Convention, all of which were born in 1992. So we were born in 1971, so we're pretty old and mature, and I think we're pretty much allowed to give wisdom to anybody who requires to be given wisdom. Those three elements of our work, wetlands protection, the wise use and international collaboration are really the epitome of what this convention means. We have 172 contracting parties, your governments that sit at our table, that make decisions for wetlands around the world. And this network of protected areas, and we are the only convention that has assets. You can name a country and I can tell you at least where your wetlands are. And I'll say you have a Ramsar site in that location and you have a space in that location. We have assets as a convention. Your country, before it becomes a member of the convention, designates a wetland of international importance. And there's a commitment by your country to say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to measure Point A, point B, these are the coordinates of the wetland. This is the extent. This is the number of species that are there. Is it coastal? Is it inland? Is it an oasis? I'm actually going to visit an oasis in UAE because I've never seen one. I come from Zambia where I was born. What does a wetland in a desert look like? So we have all these beautiful assets and all of these very much contribute to element of sustainability. So even before the SDGs were born, in 1971, our convention, your convention, was talking about the element of wise use. Now, the definition of wise, I think it's left to you, intellectualized, to define. So these are our assets all around the world. You can go on our website, you can click on country, and it will tell you where the wetlands are. Click on it to give you all the data. We have a fantastic database. And most of the times, this information happens to be incomplete because the person in government may have moved or the person who was responsible for what. So we are always reaching out to the governments, please update, please update, please update. And you have those Ramsar sites everywhere around the world. Now, what is the governance mechanism of this convention? So we have like all the different conventions, what is called the Conference of the Parties, which you are all very familiar with, I imagine. So this brings every three years. We only meet every three years. So this time last year, um, I started my job as Secretary General last October. November last year, we had our Conference of the Parties, the 14th Conference of the Parties in Geneva, and it was supposed to be in Wuhan, China. Unfortunately, for the obvious reasons you know, with the COVID situation, we could not have this uh, meeting in China. So we had a virtual meeting in Wuhan and an in-person in Geneva. That is the Conference of the Parties. And below that, the president of the Conference of the Party also becomes the chair of what is called the Standing Committee. The Standing Committee is really the decision-making body, the one that goes through all the governance mechanism. This is what we have agreed at the, 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 the Conference of the Parties. These are the resolutions that we have agreed. We have agreed, for instance, Resolution 1420 talks about wetlands and education. Why do wetlands and education, the work that you're doing here, um, Arne and colleagues, all of this gets discussed in the Standing Committee. And the Standing Committee meets three times before the next conference of the party. And below that, we also have the element of communication. How do we talk about communication, raising awareness, which is called SIPA? And then we also have a scientific and technical review panel of which, for instance, Aichi Delft and, and uh, Dr. Van Dam himself is a part of. So the science is so critical. What work, what is emerging in the world of wetlands? Why does it matter? And we have to be informed by the science. And this is why these uh, you know, institutions such as this one really, really are important. And lastly, but not the least, is a secretariat. So I have 23 people in the secretariat that are really trying to drive this entire machinery and support 172 countries plus partners. 
So it's not a small fit. And we have a strategic plan, and that strategic plan is really uh, now almost coming to an end. It's the fourth strategic plan, which is really focusing on those goals, which what we've been doing for the last few years. And this strategic plan is going to come to an end towards the end of next year. And when we meet in Zimbabwe, in Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe, for the next conference of the parties, COP15, the governments will now endorse the fifth strategic plan. For now, those are the four elements. So we're looking at addressing the issue of the drivers of wetland loss. We're also looking at this element of effectiveness and connectivity. Why does it actually matter? And then the element of really making sure that wise use, what does wise use really mean? And lastly, but not the, the, the least, enhancing implementation. Because your governments have committed to those sites that you saw, how do you actually implement the convention at the country level? Even here in the Netherlands, how does the Dutch government implement the convention here in this country? Now, our work around wetlands is also connected to other multilateral spaces. So, for example, last year in December in Montreal, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity also met, and the outcome of that meeting was what is called the Global Biodiversity Framework, the GBF. And then in 2015, on the margins of the COP21 in Paris, um, there emerged what is called the Agenda 2030, which you may be familiar with. So the Sendai framework dealing with disaster risk reduction and the Paris Agreement also emerged on the margins of that COP21. So it's very much intersectional and countries that are part of our convention are also dealing with all these elements of multilateralism. And what's missing there is also the issue of desertification because desertification is also a key issue for wetland systems. We do have what is called the World Wetlands Day on the 2nd of February. Um, it's now a United Nations Day because it was passed as a United Nations General Assembly resolution uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and now, because it's passed as a United Nations General Assembly resolution, that means that anybody, any country, even if you're not part of the convention, you celebrate World Wetlands Day. And on World Wetlands Day, we also look forward to your stories. We want to hear what's happening in your community, how it's going, what you're doing. And last year, the theme of World Wetlands Day was it's time for wetland restoration. So we're very excited. Many countries engage. People send us videos from schools. Um, it's, it's just a fun day. And next year, the theme um, is wetlands and human well-being. So please share with us your pictures, your thoughts, your reflections. It's going to be absolutely exciting. So about a year um, in 2021, when the convention twin turned 50, we also uh, released this report, which is an important report and worth having a look at. The Global Wetlands Outlook is an important report because this report also really has a lot of contributions from many scientists, from many policymakers. Why should we be conserving these wetland systems? And this particular convention that is now more than 50 years old why is it relevant? Why is it important? So our conventions, your countries, also develop or submit what are called national reports. In those national reports, they tell us what they're doing, how they're doing it, and giving us information that is also connected to the sustainable development goals. Because we do not want to report things that are sitting outside of the element of sustainability and other multilateral spaces. And then this also provides a measure of really understanding the direction in which we're going, the wetland loss that's existing, or if a wetland is endangered. For example, we have examples right now, I was just meeting with the ambassador of Argentina a week ago on lithium, because most of the Altiplano in the Andes is getting decimated, and it's in Ramsar sites, and they're just extracting and extracting and most of these organizations that are doing that are either European companies or Chinese companies. So what exactly is happening there? So all of this gets consolidated and it goes into the national report. And then we do an analysis as a secretariat. This is what's happening. And this is the true picture 
of what the stage of our, our convention is. We also have what are called international organization partners, one of which is home here in, 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 uh, in the Netherlands. And I had the opportunity to actually meet with the, the CEO of Wetlands International, uh, Han de Groot, for lunch today. And Wetlands International is one of the six IOPs that we work with, and then the rest are there listed. BirdLife International, WWF. These international organization partners are present in many, many parts of the world and support the implementation. And sometimes, for example, in the case of the Argentina-Chilean situation with the lithium crisis, they shared with us what's happening on the ground. And then we go to the government and say, well, looks like there's some drama happening right there. How are you going to resolve it? And of course, sometimes they ask us, who's your source? We say, well, our IOP is the source. And here's the report and here's the evidence. And so I, I talked a little bit about the scientific and technical uh, review panel. So they meet and discuss, etc. I'm going to go to something that is more exciting and away from the multilateralism and really talk about the intersectionality of wetlands. And I think really following up onto the amazing uh, presentation that uh, Rodante made, it's the, the, the complexity of life is this. How do you put some of these puzzles? And I think this will be part of your, your master's work. How do you really talk about this interconnectedness of life and everything, governance systems, frameworks, and all of that? And because I love food, and I love to cook, I'll talk about one of my really favorite, and because I, I don't come from a coastal country, one of the most sites I absolutely love are mangrove systems. They are phenomenal, stunning, and this is the intersection between land and sea. This is where the water comes in from upstream and then enters the sea. This is where the brackish water, this is where some of the life beginnings of many species happens. And you may have had a meal of some of those things that, whose life begins in mangrove systems. Of course, some of the upper areas of where mangroves are is where the rice paddies are. So there's rice, there's, of course, uh, some nice sushi there, some shrimps. I hope I'm not making you hungry after you already had some lunch. I went to Gabon, and I had the most exquisite fish in Gabon. And in Douala, when you go to Douala in Cameroon, you see all these women smoking the fish. Now, smoked fish in most of Central and West Africa is a multi-million dollar industry. You heard me, right? If you have to have egusi, for those of you who are Nigerians, egusi is a thing. Dried fish is a multi-million, if not billion dollar industry. And most of the drying of the fish, you have to use mangrove wood for a certain flavor, for a certain taste. So how do you work with communities to make sure, or how have communities made sure they do not decimate their mangrove systems for that delicacy? And because I come from Zambia, this ceremony, how many have ever heard, seen this ceremony before? This is the kuomboka. Now, the Kumboka ceremony is one of the most exquisite ceremony and a multi-million dollar revenue earner for Zambia. Now, the badge that you see is the badge of a king, the Litunga. The Litunga migrates from the lowland of the floodplain when it floods to the highland. And that migration, the Kumboka, is actually the movement in a floodplain system. In some years, this ceremony has not taken place for the simple reason that the flood is not flooded. And it's a spectacular ceremony. People fly in from all over the world, and it's a massive, the Barotse floodplains are huge on the Zambezi River. And for those of you that know, the Zambezi River is a shallow river. Now, this happens in the west of Zambia, and I don't know if I have a pointer. Um, I think the pointer is somewhere. 
<laughs> Thank you. I'll just take the. Don't know if this is on. Okay. This is oh, brilliant. No, it's that works. Perfect. So, there's a basic flag plane. So, the Lichunga is in this town in Mongu. And the flag plane is expensive, it's massively expensive. Now, this also speaks to the element of culture. Wetlands are not just spaces where birds and animals floric and play. Wetlands are also spaces where cultures have thrived and survived and existed. But because I was talking about that puzzle that I shared with you, the intersectionality of wetland spaces in Switzerland, this year in June, the government of Switzerland had to meet. When I moved to Switzerland late last year with my children, my young children, they're 11 and 9, they were excited. They were like, oh my God, we're going to Switzerland. Of course, they arrived and hated the cold. And then went to the ski slopes for the first time in January because it's mandatory to be in a Swiss school and go to the ski slope and learn how to ski. Now, for those of you that have living in parts of Europe, at least the Alpine countries, we know that last year there was not enough snow in the Alps. Hugely problematic. My son and daughter went to ski once. They liked it, they loved it, and then suddenly all the ski trips were cancelled. The Swiss government had to have a referendum to discuss the situation in the Alps. And part of that element of conversation is the issue of intersectionality, those pieces of the puzzle. They were talking climate change, they were talking cleaner energy, because most of their rivers are water supplying the water with hydroelectricity. Glacial recession. There's been some floods in parts of Switzerland and further down in some alpine spaces. So you begin to see how governance systems also come into play. Now, because I'm talking about sustainable development goals, I just want to show you this, this, uh, this, this uh, it's difficult to read, but really it speaks to the intersectionality and how wetlands are central to all elements of sustainability, be it that kuomboka, the social dynamics, the culture, be it the food systems, be it the gender dimension, be it the energy conversation, wetlands are very intersectional and really cut across all the 17 elements of the sustainable development goals. <laughs> and so as a result of this, this year was also the midpoint of the sustainable development goals. We only have six years to go before the end of the sustainable development goals. And what is the adage of the, the SDGs? Leave no one behind, correct? The COVID pandemic took us back to 2008 poverty levels, just in case you don't know. So we regressed. So how do we leapfrog to not leave anyone behind? And who are these who are not leaving behind? It's a very complicated question. So I want to give you a little bit of um, really coming to sort of towards the tail end of my presentation, this timeline. And I want to show you something. So when I joined, we had the convention, the, the contracting party, as I mentioned, we had this conference of the parties. And very quickly, we had World War Women's Day happening in February. And then in March, I went to the UN Water Conference. And I had a fantastic meet with Hank Ovik, who is at the Netherlands, are uh, two of uh, one of two envoys for the UN Water Conference together with Tajikistan. The world met for the second time in 46 years. How many years? We meet for the second time to discuss water. The world met for the second time in New York at the Second World Water Conference to discuss water. And of course, very quickly in the middle there, we have the SDG Summit, we have the UN General Assembly, and then the standing committee, and now we're heading towards the COP in Dubai. So let's see how that goes. But that really just tells you how there's been a lot of conversation around the world, and a lot of conversations are being really happening around the issue of water around the world. So as a result of our Conference of the Parties last year, one year exactly today, 
We had 21 resolutions. There was a Wuhan declaration reaffirming the urgency of wetlands, but also really talking about what do we do differently going forward and how we have to talk about mitigation, adaptation, etc. When I was landing in New York, that is Hampstead in New York. When you're landing in Manhattan towards JFK, what you see over here, these are seagrasses. This is what keeps me warm from having those king tides and big waves. This wetland system is what keeps New York safe. When this disappears, as you can see, it's advancing. Now, this is also where you see the intersectional and connectivity because the rivers are flowing in. The Hudson flows all the way into the system, the sea grasses. So people need to understand that even for mega cities, I know we watch those Hollywood movies and think that the day after tomorrow seems to be like a joke, but it's become a reality for many other places in the world. So when I came out of New York, I was a little confused. I was like, okay, so this water conference, what is exactly, what, 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 what did we agree on at the water conference? Well, there was a water agenda. And look at the second point. There was 700, believe me, I cannot even remember two of those commitments. 700 commitments came out of that. You can Google that, you can check. Most of it was very much connected to water delivery urban sanitation, water supply, well-managed wetlands, buffering, cleaning, sanitation, and all of that, etc. But the reality is we have to have resilient wetland systems to be able to do that. We cannot just talk about, you know, big words. We have 700 commitments. And by the way, New York as a city is a city of 8 million people plus, because there's in and out people that come in during the day. All of New York water supply comes from the Cotswold, which is upstream from massive wetland systems. In fact, the New York water facility people who I met, I said, well, how are you actually making sure that your 8 million people have water? They do a whole interbasin water transfer. They go interstate and borrow water from the next state. I said, whoa, that's not really borrowing. You're just using more for a mega city like New York. So I'm gonna give some uh, examples of country because this is what excites me. It really gets me excited because uh, my job takes me in different places. Let's start with Belize. How many of you know Madonna, the musician? So Madonna did a fantastic song many years ago. Maybe some of you were not born, but the song is called La Isla Bonita. If you listen to the song of La Isla Bonita, the island of San Pedro, I was in San Pedro, the very island. It is stunning. And I woke up one morning, I went for a run along the coast, and it was just, I was like, so this is the La Isla Bonita. Okay, this looks good. And when you fly in to La Isla Bonita, this is what you see, the atolls. Beautiful, stunning, the mangroves, the blue water, turquoise water. It's amazing. And then I go for a run because I love running in the morning. And then I see the human footprint. So this was, as I was running, you see the boot. Somebody just threw, decided to throw a shoe. And the plastic waste. But what you also find on La Isla Bonita is sargassum. This is a leaf. Now, sargassum, when it floats, and it's everywhere in the Caribbean, when it floats and arrives on your shores, it smells like eggs, rotten eggs. Awful. So I'm running and I'm thinking, what is that smell? Ew. Sargassum, everywhere, everywhere. So the waves, the movement, and everything is coming now into coastal wetlands. So you begin to see the complexity and problematic. So I asked my colleague from the government, the government of, of, of uh, Belize, I said, sorry, these shoes, 
He's like, Dr. Nsonga, I need to just wash on shore. I take you to Mexico. I love your country. But it's a complicated country. So, the emblem of many of our countries, if you look at your flags, you look at your emblems, most of the emblems have a connection to our nature. And a lot of the emblems around the world, and this particular one from Mexico, also has a connection to their indigenous peoples. This is in the flag of Mexico. Now, what you see is an eagle. There's a folklore, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, Pedro. There's a folklore, the Mexicas, the indigenous people of Aztec, which is what today Mexico, parts of Mexico and others. The Mexica, the Mexicana, there was a belief that they traveled all around this bit of Mexico and even parts of America. And there was a vision by an indigenous elder that said that when you see the eagle eating the snake over the water, that is where we shall settle. And they settled in this part of Mexico City. Now what you see, this is not a very good picture of it. So there's the eagle, there's the agave, which is also really the, the, the true story of Mexico, which is what makes tequila, which is very yummy. And then here is the water, this wetland, water. So our peoples, our communities have connected systems, places. So I get to Mexico and I'm introduced to young people, old people of Mexicana heritage on a wetland system which is stunning and massive next to the Mexico City Airport. And this wetland system called Texicoco is phenomenal. We drove around it, we walked around it. Now the story of this Ramza site is incredible. The people around this wetland system next to the airport fought and told the government, you are not expanding the airport. This is our heritage. This, that's what you see in the flag of Mexico. This is the land that belongs to the Mexicano. This is what makes Mexico, Mexico. You cannot destroy it. Now what's interesting is almost three quarters of the sewage of Mexico City goes into the Shanta side. And then the wetland does what it does. And by the way, they had already started trying to make the airport. So you have all these runway things that were there, but then it just floods. What wetlands do. Now, what is very interesting is the, met, the wetland does what it does. It filters, cleans out, does all the necessary work. Downstream of here, as the wetland is really working so hard, is a pipeline. The pipeline of water goes all the way to a place called Hidalgo to water the land across Hidalgo, which is a transboundary water transfer, so that they can grow avocado and corn, both of which are water intense crops in a dry land. And most of that is going to the US because you know they like guacamole and tortilla. Now, what's happening? is because of what's happening, and I was on the seventh, eighth floor of the minister's office, and it was stunning to see Mexico City at night. Beautiful. But Mexico City is sinking. Slowly but surely, it's sinking. Because we've taken too much from the groundwater. It's over-abstracted. In fact, in Mexico City, what I found fascinating was I was going around and asking my colleague, Me que pasa? There is Rio, Rio something, and Rio something, but I don't see a river. It's like, oh, so that we built all over the rivers. The city is sinking. So in all of these places that I've been traveling to, different parts of the world, I've been trying to understand what exactly is going on. 
But to be here where I am as the Secretary General of the Convention, it's taken a bit of a journey. So perhaps this is the moment I also talk a little bit about myself. So a not so short history of myself. <laughs> and what inspired me, I was an intern at the Convention on Wetlands 25 years ago. I left the government of Zambia. I pretty much quit my job as a biologist on the river, walking, working on water hyacinths. And I said, I'm going to Switzerland. Can I just speak French? No. I'm going to figure it out. And I go. So I left and came to Switzerland. I was born in the north of Zambia, in a little town called Mansa. And as you can see, there are all those rivers and lakes. My grandparents, my paternal grandparents, had a lot of properties and work around this region around. So I grew up seeing all these rivers, wetlands, spaces that were stunning and beautiful. And as a kid, my twin sister and I used to go swimming in the river, which was like 100 meters away from my grandmother's house. So we'd swim in the river. And I remember one time a friend of ours got attacked by a monitor lizard. We thought it was a crocodile. We fought that monitor lizard. We yanked it. I don't know what a 10-year-old energy, like you're high on adrenaline or something. We just fought the thing, yanked our friend off, so blood and everything. It's like, we're coming back swimming tomorrow. <laughs> These wetland systems that gave us fruit along the river and spaces, they were just beautiful. So I leave Zambia. I leave Zambia and I go and join the Convention on Wetlands. And in between, I work for WWF. And when I was in WWF, I got a little curious. I was like, you know what? I had kind of understood what it is that we're trying to do. But I think I need a little bit more education. I've done my first degree at University of Zambia, but I need a little bit more education. Scouted, 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 and I got a scholarship to University College London. And I was very fortunate because the scholarship I got, and I became the first Ted Hollis scholar, was a man called Edward Hollis who died at a Whiteland conference. And well wishes put money together for this scholarship, and I became the first scholar for that scholarship. When I was finished with my PhD in wetland hydrology, I did my PhD on the Kafua River system in Zambia, which is a massive wetland system which has two hydroelectric dams on either side. And I saw what invasive species can do, how they can change the wetland ecosystem, and what it means to run out of energy in a country when there's drought. Zambia can have up to 14 hour blackouts. How do you resolve this? How do you develop a country when you have 14 hour blackouts? And then I went to the United Nations. When I worked to the United Nations, that gave me the privilege to be at the table as a diplomat. You know what I used to do as an activist in WWF? I was like, yeah, I saw that shit. <laughs> and then I, I went to the United Nations and they're like, you can't do that. <laughs> You can't say that to a diplomat. Say it nicely, or just don't say anything. It was so interesting navigating this world and understanding negotiations. How do you support countries? Multilateralism, what changes? How does it not change? The frustration of countries, the countries being together, being the United Nations. What does that actually mean? How united is united? Well, after 13, 14 years, I was like, I think I'm going to go back to what I love more, wetland systems. So I'm back. So you may ask, what influenced or inspired me, um, or who influenced or guided me? And I want to share this picture. On the very far end is my professor at the University of Zambia. He's very dear to me. He's now 82 years old, Professor Harry Chibwala was my professor. When I registered at University College, uh, University of Zambia, I was actually going to study medicine. And then my stepmother said, do you want some of blood? She was a nurse. I was like, no. Come to the hospital for a day. I went to that Mansa hospital where I was born, and I walked out of there and said, I cannot be blood. <laughs> this, this is such a useless idea. And because I love the river so much, I was like, I'm going to do something maybe with education, with teaching, and with rivers. So I go to University of Zambia, and by some space of serendipity, 
I meet Professor Harry Chabala, a veteran ecologist. He said, we have a fantastic course. It's in conservation biology. And blah, blah, blah. I said, I'm like, I'm registered in education. Of course you can take it. And the rest is history. And then I was an intern at Ramsar in 1998. And he came to see me, and I was blown away. And I say, thank you so much for the inspiration. But I also want to say that for me, it's also a personal story. Because my father said, you don't want, you hate the smell of blood, right? Just go and do whatever you want you can do. Is that a good degree? Just get the degree. My father gave us such leverage, me and my twin sister. My twin sister is a professor of health communication. So last year we went to, se to celebrate his 70th birthday. And my father gave us such leverage as two young girls and say, go and be what you want to be. And I remember being at a family reunion once where um, I say, in that spirit of being a doctor, um, I say to my uncle, I said, you yeah, know, I'm going to be a doctor when I finish high school. He said, you're a nurse. My father said, no, you heard her. Should be the first doctor in the family. And that spirit of being encouraged, being bold, being able to be supported is also something extremely beautiful. But I also came from very fearless women. This is my grandmother, Nomata Kazela, really Glamini, a closer woman, mixed race, was born in the Eastern Cape in Idumcha, Tolo Osaka from the clan of Mahadeh. She trained as a nurse in the middle of apartheid. But she was also very lucky because she grew up in the trans sky, which was the Bantustans and the free standing states where, for all purposes, because my great-grandfather was married to a white woman, they were allowed to intermarry. Anywhere else, you were not. And then she comes out of the Bantustan and then she realizes, oh, I can't even get a job as a nurse in this my country. So her marries a guy and tells him, I think since now we're part of the political party called ANC, we can go to Zambia. Let's go. And my grandfather's like, what? Are you sure? Yes, we're going. Everybody's going in exile to Zambia. And she went to Zambia in exile. And she became the first non-Zambian matron of the University of Teaching Hospital of Zambia. So for me, what I saw in her was all this fearlessness. She left her country, she came, it was just story, and she would dance on the dance floor, and she'd be like, hey, do you know what we used to do with Miriam Makeba? Yo, 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 yo. And I'd be like, <laughs> for me, it was just, she was my grandmother. I had no clue who Miriam Makeba was. Until I was in my 20s, I was like, what? She knew the what? But all of these to say, never take anything for granted from your families. This is a picture of my grandmother, my paternal grandmother. She got widowed young, with eight children, and she's left with this business empire. No secondary school certificates or education, but made the best negotiations to make sure that our family had a trust fund to educate girls in my hometown, in Mansa. And she sits rather, rather inconspicuously in the corner, and you can see the rest of the picture, right? It's all men. This is in the 70s. And she was so calm, she was so chilled, but the decisions that she made, even as not so educated, she went to not school to learn accounting. Because her husband had left trucks, he had died rather prematurely, left trucks, buses and buildings and she had to look at those numbers to make sure she, they made sense to her she was running a business she had people that were employed i cannot make sure i have to make there were fishing trucks all of this getting fish from the wetland systems upstream she made sure that was maintained and when i remember seeing this picture i didn't think much about it i was like you know and then i come into the united nations and i'm hearing about gender and whatever. And then I went to that picture. And I'm like, my word. In the 70s. That, so this is the kind of heritage. 
that I've also come from that has inspired me, that has also encouraged me, even when sometimes I feel like we're failing, there's so many in our histories, in our heritage, who've paved the way so that we're here to do what we do. So in closing, I really want to show this picture because this picture for me talks about what is the work of life. The very element of planetary health, the connectivities. And frankly, because we have less than pretty much six years before the SDGs end, how do we talk about planetary health beyond SDGs? Because where we live, where we come from, whether it's cities or villages or towns or whatever they may be, wetlands are very instrumental in our very existence and in our very survival. So I leave you with a picture of Kigali, Rwanda, which I really like very much because Rwanda designated a wetland um, smack in the middle of Kigali. And it's fascinating because in Kigali City, you can see the city advancing, but President Kagame made some specific leadership where he just said, if we cannot have clean water in this city, it doesn't make sense. Why are they destroying these wetland systems? So, Kigali last year in November became a wetland city accredited under our convention, and they have restored huge amounts of wetlands, the whole strip in the middle of Kigali City. If you're ever in Kigali, there's the Nyandungu Wetland Center, which you can visit, phenomenal. For the first time, even the rare birds that you could not see in Kigali, you can see them in this wetland city, um, in the wetland area of Kigali. It's amazing, it's phenomenal. And there's a fantastic photographer, who you can follow either on Twitter or any social media, his name is Will Wilson, and he has photographed birds across, and every day he posts a new bird that he sees in Kigali City, it's the Nominal. So that's what I want to do. Thank you so much for listening. I'm speechless, and I, you could have carried on and you wouldn't have noticed. Yeah. Yeah. This is why I didn't even but think that. But I'm looking at the watch. Me. Yeah, thank God we have watches there because I wouldn't even, I couldn't even look back at the watch. Thank you so much for a wonderful inspiration talk. Thank you so much for that. And uh, you know, uh, this I want to put it out because we often talk about what is this model about? And the thing is, you pick up skills as you go along the way, but this is the model where you pick up inspiration. So I'm so glad we had this talk. So we'll get into the Q&A session right now, or what we could do, if you're up for it, because I have a feeling no one's really that tired anymore. <laughs> so if you want, we can go for a five minute break, come back and have a Q&A. All you want to carry on? Yeah. Oh, yes. That's sweet. So, where do we start? Oh, we have some questions. Oh. oh, that's a fascinating box. <laughs> can, I, can I just ask you to introduce yourself? Because I always like to, for people to just say their names and maybe the country they're coming from, if that's okay. Hi, so my name is Yuka Machine, I'm from South Africa. My grandmother also comes from the beach. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm very simple. Uh, I just want to find out, with, um, with the whole climate change and everything going on, we need to have sort of our natural infrastructure needs to be robust. You know? Sorry? Our natural infrastructure needs to be robust. So, we're going to be robust because, like you're saying, people are using them for sanitation, but they're also extracting you know, more supply from you. So, and, you know, they also use the plants. So how do you make this robust and how do you, you know, to climate change and to the impacts um, the family? Sorry, and it's, can I just ask you to, to give the mic because yeah. it's echoing and I, and I could not quite hear. Uh, so if you can just repeat your question, please. Thank you. Hi, yeah, so I was asking you, how do you, you know, in the context of climate change and uh, urban development, how do you make wetlands so robust? Ah, okay, how do we make wetlands robust? For sure, I mean, so here, here's the challenge. Uh, we were talking about the issue of lithium, right? And, and extraction. So a lot of wetland systems, as I started at the very beginning, how they've been used as wastelands, just dump, 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 dump. Now, the thing is, whether we like it or not, nature speaks. Nature will tell us. 
either through degradation, there's not going to be enough, or there's diseases emerging, etc. And this is why the science matters. That picture that Rodenta showed actually at the very beginning of the quality of the water is speaking to the, to the element of resilience. How resilient is your system? If your system is having more bacteria, if your system is, is having more, uh, you know, elements in the water that are killing people, surely it's not resilient enough. Something is problematic. So what we do also with our national reports as a convention and similarly with other multilateral processes is to really do an analysis. How resilient is the system? This is also why, as, 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 a, as a convention, we also have, which I didn't talk about, is the wetland city accreditation. How, because most, in fact, 70% of us will be living in cities in the next 20 years. And most of these wetlands are either, you know, running through cities. How, it, how resilient is it? So those scientific parameters, and they have to be monitored continuously. Data has to be monitored continuously. Because what we're finding, for example, is I was in China, where the government of China is just talking about mangroves. Same thing in Gabon. Same thing in Mexico. Same thing in Costa Rica. But the level of degradation in these mangrove systems is varied. Now, to measure that element of resiliency or robustness, I went to Costa Rica. The first picture that I showed you of the, um, the, first picture that I showed you of the, the wetland system when I was in Costa Rica, I was fascinated because this system, so NOAA, the U.S. NOAA, is actually doing all the analysis to know how much carbon is actually sequestered in this mangrove system. If we lose 60% of this mangrove system, how much goes out? And this information, not only does it come to our national report, it also goes to the nationally determined contribution report of Costa Rica for the UNFCCC. So you, you, see, you see how they're interconnected? It has, because we need to know what the data is. Yeah. So for instance, let's say. Uh, sorry, okay. sorry, just one question. So one person, one person, they say one person, one vote. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's someone in the front here. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm from South Sudan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so humbling to have you here uh, in South Sudan. We have the Sutra wetland. It's one of the largest uh, wetland in the world with uh, 57,000 kilometers. And uh, the suit And the Ramses site. Yeah, exactly. Uh, suit has been the center of conflict uh, since the creation between Egypt, Sudan, and the southern Sudan, uh, which is South Sudan uh, for now. Uh, recently, uh, last year, there has been discussion on the dredging uh, proposed by Egypt uh, in order to uh, deliver more water to Egypt, uh, to deal with the government of South Sudan. And it was, of course, by the community. Uh, the community is against the trading, uh, and so there was a national debate which uh, attracted international uh, uh, concern, uh, and it was uh, carried out in Cuba. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, Egypt went under the ground with the politicians to deliver bulldozers to one of the states, and currently there are issues that are being discussed. Uh, of the region. Uh, so my concern is that uh, you said uh, you receive uh, reports from the government on the wetlands, uh, but then I don't know exactly if there is something you do specifically to validate this kind of reports and see whether uh, the government is doing uh, the necessary needs or uh, there are some improvement needed. Thank you. No, thank you very much. The issue of the Jangoli Canal is, is a critical issue. This is something that I even worked on many over 12, 15 years ago when I was doing my PhD. Um, and, and it's a very important issue. I also happen to have spent a bit of my career working on the Nile Basin. So the Nile River Basin, South Sudan, became one of the new 
countries, member states, and I was working with the United Nations Environment Program when I was working on the on the um, on on on, uh, on the issue of the Nile. Now, the issue of the Nile is also a very complex issue because now Egypt is no longer part of Nilecom, as you know. Egypt and Sudan and South Sudan are contracting parties to our convention. So back to your question, the issue of the Jangoli Canal and the issues that are there have already been reported to us by UNEP as an international agency, which we have a partnership with and we're discussing. I think the issue of consultation is very critical at the national level. A lot of times countries are doing what they're doing. It's a little bit to what uh, um, you know, Rodante was referring to this Mongolia case and Rio Tinto, et cetera. These experiences in these countries, I think even South Sudan, one of the things I was discussing with UNEP, I'm gonna be in Nairobi in about two weeks. One of the issues I was discussing with UNEP, how do we support the government of Egypt, uh, of, of, of uh, South Sudan on these issues? Because it's a young nation. You don't even have enough negotiators for your climate discussion. You don't have enough negotiators to your multilateral space. This is why, even as a part of the East Africa bloc, you can actually source expertise from next door. This is important. And the United Nations Environment Program Office of Africa is actually on this, discussing, because a lot of stuff, colleagues, you know, sometimes government tell you, no, we're not actually doing anything. You know, the Egyptians will come and say, we're not doing anything. In fact, you know, we just let this lie low. You just have to go and click on a satellite image. Earth observations tell a different story. You can see this thing. So one of the things that UNEP is doing is really to map and do an assessment of that, to be able to share that information with us as a convention and it's discussed within that standing committee that I, I shared with you, because this is important. And this is one of the elements of this convention, the enforcement of issues that are happening in Ramza sites, because that activity is problematic and is perverse for not just the indigenous peoples and the local communities, it is problematic for the system as a whole. It destabilizes the system. So that is underway. I don't know who's next. Uh, uh, oh. Thank you for the good presentation. My name is Isaac Chuno uh, from Kenya. Uh, I wanted to ask now the issue of uh, modernization and uh, the way that uh, the population grow. We have very serious issues, especially even in Kenya in terms of wetlands. We have found that already developments have undertaken places where wetlands were there. Uh, moving people and move, getting people to go uh, to move out of the wetland has become a really big challenge. Maybe now uh, people are thinking towards now having the kind of uh, developed uh, wetlands uh, in the cities. So, what is the position maybe of the convention of wetlands on those? Uh, is, it, is it being recognized as a Ramsar site where for wetlands, constructed wetlands? Thank you. Sure. First of all, I, I want to talk, Isaac, on the issue of population. You have come to the most densely populated country, densely populated, called the Netherlands. And um, this argument of saying that because of population growth is a very problematic and weak argument. And what we do have is an issue of governance. How we have systems in place. I don't think it's an issue. And, and, and Redenta did touch a little bit to that. It's, it's a complex conversation. But for me, as an African, I have issues with that argument. What we do have is an issue of governance. How do we govern in spaces in such a way. If you think about it, I can tell you for free that where my father comes from, the Bemba, in northern Zambia, and I come from the royal house of the Chitimukulu, we had spaces, sacred groves, umushitu, umsitu in Kiswahili. Nobody, nobody grew food anywhere, 500 to a kilometer range within the Musitu. Because the traditional governance system was that is a sacred space, that is the source of water, that is our space, the traditional systems that governed our spaces. Let's come into a space of modernity. 
what we have seen, people have been, example of Kibera, because I'm going there in a few weeks. So for those of you that don't know, Kibra or Kibera is one of Africa's largest slum dwellings in Nairobi. You can see it in The Constant Gardener, which is a fantastic and very sad film, but they did a beautiful shot of Kibra. Now, the Nairobi River flows through Kibera. What we see is also the complexity and marginalization of an original Nubian peoples stuck around wealth. And when you look at the historical map of Nairobi, when I moved to Nairobi 20 years ago, because my children are half Kenyan, when I moved there, I was very fascinated because I like maps and I'm a geographer. I said, okay, what is okay? There's Muthaiga and then there's this. And, and all of these spaces, even where the coffee farms were, are informal settlements. Now, what we've inherited post-independence are spaces where the management of land systems also tapers into the wetland systems. Now, what we need to do, Nairobi, the word Nairobi means the place of sweet waters. The Maasai knew where they protected the areas and the spaces, etc. Back to your question. Constructed wetlands. One of the issues that we're beginning to discuss is the restoration of, of uh, the Nairobi River. Along, you know, President uh, Ruto is now has a commission to look at this. And part of the recovery and discussion around is constructed wetland systems. How do we save a river but also have some wetlands that are constructed to try and save and basically filter out the pollution that goes in there? But let's talk about plastic, the plastic issue that was mentioned earlier on. It's very problematic there, hugely problematic and really challenging. So what we do as a convention is also to encourage countries. One of the resolutions that we do have, if you go on our website, is a resolution on small wetlands. And some of these wetlands are constructed spaces. And case in point is Lake Naivasha. Now, Lake Naivasha is very much intimately connected to the Netherlands because most of the Dutch companies that are flower farms farm their wetlands, farm their flowers on Lake Naivasha. Now, when I worked on Lake Naivasha in 2005, 2006, what I mentioned to the government of the Netherlands and also to flower farmers is you have to have constructed wetlands next to Lake Naivasha. Lake Naivasha is a Ramsar site. There was tons of pollution, water hyacinths, huge problems when they constructed these wetlands to filter the waste into the lake. It changed everything. But when we look at our map for the actual landscape of our Ramses site, they're included. So in a simple, non-complicated way, yes, they can be considered as protected areas. So we have to really think about the governance of our spaces, how we, this is why the cities conversation is very important. UN Habitat is trying to think through that. How do we settle in a way that is not complicated for the very ecosystems that we're dependent on? Okay. Um, thank you very much for the amazing the lecture. My name is Fermi from Nigeria. Where is Fermi? I'm here. Right. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. Um, I just want to ask, um, how much work is being done in Nigeria as a convention, and um, how does the science in Nigeria perform? Um, secondly, um, from the lecture, we I mean, I've got to understand that the wetlands have a lot of connections with um, humans, agricultural health, and the rest. So, talking about the health, I I want to ask what exactly is being done. Um, on the um, wetlands to monitor the health impacts, specifically on disease transmission. Because I know the WHO has um, environmental sites, um, surveillance sites, the EA sites, where um, samples have been gotten to examine the um, presence of um, certain pathogens for disease transmission and the rest. So, uh, what's the correlation between, does this, um, these uh, wetlands, these rapture sites, do they have any relationship with the WHO ES sites? Or what exactly can we do? To, because we have a lot of people that have direct and indirect um, connection with the um, wetlands. So how do we monitor the health implications on those who actually use this directly? Mm -hmm. Now, thank you so much for that question. So Nigeria, 
Nigeria is very special to me because I used to do a lot of work in um, in in uh, in Agoni, uh, when I worked for the United Nations Environment Program. Um, it's a piece of trivia because it's not a secret; it's it's public knowledge. You can see it on our website, on our finances. Nigeria has been a contracting party for almost 25 years, and it has not paid its dues. So I'm meeting your ambassador in Geneva and having a chat uh, because. You know, you need to contribute for me to, to be able to mobilize my Africa team to go to Nigeria and do what. But that's not to say they haven't been. Now, um, health and wetlands. Health and wetlands is absolutely very critical, and which is why we're having the wetlands and human health, human well-being theme next year. Agoni. Agoni, Port Harcourt, for those that know, and also very intimately connected to here in the Netherlands. Shell, the pipelines of the oil fields, run through one of the most extensive wetland systems in Agoni. You just have to Google Agoni plus oil plus people and you will see what I mean. Toxics of the highest order. There are deformities of the highest order. There are problems and this is not just specific to Nigeria. I did a lot of work in Peru and the first time I went to the Andes, I was blown away. The, when you go to the Andes and then you see the intersectional space of the Amazon and the Andes region, it's mind-blowing, it's beautiful, it's stunning. And then you're shocked out of your wits about the illegal diamond and gold mining that happens there, but mostly gold. It is scary, colleagues, scary, <laughs> because gold uses mercury. And as we speak today, the Minamata Convention is meeting in Geneva to talk exactly about that. Now that mercury, when it goes into our bloodstreams, and which is why we no longer use, remember when we were, you know, we had to, are you feeling okay? Thermometer with mercury, do you see them again? Phase out, because of multilateral spaces. Simply because that material is perverse. So be it oil, be it gold mining and all of that, what we're beginning to show is that wetlands and health are very intimately connected. I'm supposed to meet with Dr. Tedros, who is the head of WHO, to really discuss exactly that for human well-being. Because for the first time in our human history, each one of us sitting here, you don't know who, me, you, there, have a piece of plastic in our blood. We're wondering, why are there more cases of dementia? Why are there certain cases of autoimmune diseases? We don't know. We have used so many problematic chemicals and forever chemicals that go into wetlands and can never disappear. They're in there. In fact, one of the biggest studies I did when I worked for WWF was to look at how much of your kitchen detergent material that you're using to wash your dishes with goes into the body of pregnant women. So these chemicals cross the umbilical cord that babies are born with many chemicals from wetland systems. So we need to understand that we are so intimately connected. And this is why in a few weeks in Nairobi, there's a big discussion on the negotiation for the first ever plastics treaty of the world, tell your governments to go. Peru is leading the negotiations. Rwanda was the champion on that. Rwanda is the first country in the world that ever banned plastics. In fact, the person at the airport would even tell you, leave your plastic on the plane. I remember being in a hotel where somebody just came and told me, madam, is that your plastic? Please take it, the cleaning lady in the hotel. Put it back in your suitcase. It doesn't stay, I was like, okay. <laughs> I picked it very quickly. So in a nutshell, what we're beginning to see more and more, we need to show the evidence. The very fact that what we do to wetlands, be it by private sector entities, be it by whoever, there's a price to pay because it will enter our bodies. There's high levels of deformities and diseases. And this is why collaboration, you saw in that triangular diagram that I showed about the convention, that is why we need to collaborate as a convention to be able to tell these stories from the bottom up. There was a question from the gentleman right behind you. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think time is uh, coming to be very short. It will also be very short. I'm an audit from South Sudan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have learned a lot from uh, these wetlands and management uh, and so forth. Uh, what I want to ask is this a bit of uh, uh, global weather conditions and uh, industrial establishment. Uh, if wetland is degraded or depleted completely, how easily is it restorable? Okay. No, thank you so much. That is a, such an important question because in 2019, we, um, meaning we, when I worked for the United Nations Environment Program together with FAO, we worked very closely with the government of El Salvador to set up and, and, and really go through a process which eventually went to the UN General Assembly uh, and became the first ever UN decade on ecosystem restoration. So when you go on both the UNEP website, in fact, it's just Google Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, fantastic. Because what this decade does, and all your countries are part of this UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, what you will see is a resolution. And in that resolution, all the countries that negotiated that resolution said, we have to conserve before we restore. Colleagues, we are entering, if we have not already, a two degree world. There are some ecosystems that when they're gone, they will never recover. There's nothing, there'll be part of this we're seeing in the Sahel, part of this we're seeing in the Americas, in parts of the United States of America, in Mexico, we are seeing lakes disappear. And when that lake disappears, I'll give you an example. In the Great Salt Lake area, in the South of America, is a lake that shrunk so much, it just became a bowl of dust. Now, what people did not realize is that all of the toxins from the farms were going where? And toxins, when they dry, they become this powder, material, and then it's particulate matter. It was so bad that when the dust storm hit part of Utah, they told everybody to stay indoors because that dust enters your lungs is almost equivalent to a nuclear bomb going off in your lungs. So your question is a fundamental question. There's a way in which the degradation of wetland system is so bad and so perverse and so dangerous that we don't even know what to anticipate or expect. So what we need is how do we conserve what we have now? And indigenous peoples and traditional peoples, if you read the Eat Best report, it has shown that indigenous peoples and traditional peoples have conserved, and in fact, most of the places where they live, which is why people in Indonesia or Malaysia are fighting to maintain those ecosystems, to say, no, 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 we don't. Just recently, Ecuador, in Ecuador, in a Ramsar site, indigenous peoples marched and said, your oil rig, we don't want it. The same thing happened in Brazil. So we're beginning to see this movement, but half the time these people are powerless. So all this to say, if we lose ecosystems, we don't know their recovery rate. So the importance that we're telling our contracting parties, the science is already showing that we need to conserve what we have in as best possible. Of course, they've been used over millennia and all of that, but let's use it in a way that is meaningful and resilient enough to really cushion these changes that are coming because we don't know what's coming, frankly. Um, my name is Robert. Um, I'm from that part of New York that loans the city of Swatter, so thank you for remembering us. Um, so uh, I had a general question about education because you were sharing about education that Ramsu does, right? And with, with kids, let's say. And um, I just wanted in general just to ask you what you think is the biggest problem, the biggest challenge that you have in, in um, inspiring these kids. And then, you know, my, my input would be uh, in, the, in the projects that I've worked in, in education, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, for water advocacy, right? 
right, for empowering uh, rural communities to advocate for uh, their wetlands, for example. Um, I sometimes struggle because you try, you know, to inspire these uh, young people that when they grow up, they can take charge of their the ecosystems that surround them, that they can advocate for them. And sometimes you ask yourself, to what degree uh, can you promise them that the power structures around, right, will actually be receptive, right? And sometimes they ask you these very uh, provocative questions that you've been avoiding, right? Where they say, you know, okay, this is great, but you know, obviously, like this this program is going to end. And what's what's the use of it, right? Will we actually have the resources and the power to um, to make a change to preserve our water, so forth, so forth? Um, so, I mean, that's the challenge that I see. What's the challenge that you see in education um, as part of the initiatives of RAMSA and how do you, you know, address it? Do you see the, the future developments that you would like for youth education? Mm -hmm. No, thank you so much for that question, Robert. I really, absolutely, I'm grateful for that question because um, as I did my, my first degree in education, I am I'm, I'm such a passionate advocate of education, but I'm also a very passionate advocate of learning from our environment, from our spaces, from our systems. And I will explain why in, in the storytelling. So um, in June, um, actually in July, I was in, um, I went to Songdo, uh, Songdo city in South Korea. And then I flew from Songdo and I went to China. Now what I saw between these two spaces was phenomenal, phenomenal. I visited the East Asia, Australasian flyway team in Songdo. They're based in Songdo. Now the East Asia Australasian flyway is one of the world's largest flyways. And most of these birds migrate across mega cities. And then I went to a center, the black faced spoonbill restoration center, beautiful place. And I meet these young volunteers and young people. And I'm like, Oh, so what really inspires you to come every day to wake up and just come to this space? And they were like, the children. I was like, okay. And they were like, Musonda, the spoonbill population has increased. We even, because the breeding period is around May, there's actually a birthday day for the spoonbills. Imagine, I mean, the kids come up dressed to come and celebrate that bird. And when I went to Shenzhen in China and to Hong Kong, there's a fantastic education center called the Fuchang, Ramza Wetland Center, Education Center. And I just see lines and lines. It was school holiday. Lines and lines and lines and lines of kids. And I'm like, oh, where are they going? I, I thought they were on holiday. I was like, no, this is part of the summer camp program. Oh, okay. And then I call out one kid, do you speak English? Because of course I cannot speak Mandarin. And they were like, yes, we love the center because now we can see in the screen, the picture, how the birds are flying because they're coming from South Korea. So there's even a twinning. Now, for me, the power of education comes from the bottom up. What projects, I've worked in project management and programs, we go in, we leave, we disappear. We don't even know what happens after we're gone. That inspiration, that learning, that exchanging, why would a community in Songdo be so interested in having a birthday day for Blackface Spoonbill? Because it was suggested by the community, by the city, the people from the city of Shenzhen and the city of Songdo. So for me, this is what, why education matters. Now, the reason the Shenzhen Bay, if you Google Shenzhen, Shenzhen is the, one of the youngest cities in China, but it's a mega city, the home of highway. I'm sure some of you have phones by highway or whatever. It's massive. And then in front of Shenzhen is a wetland that is recovering. The day I arrived in Hong Kong in my poor wetland was the first day they had monitored and seen the otters in 25 years. You know why the otters have returned? Because the community and young people have been pulling the invasive species, pulling them, going every other day, come winter, come summer. They're like, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's the invasives pulling education day. Because people are invested. So for me, the education element is, and this is part of the reason why I returned to this convention, because it gives me hope. 
And the very fact that the stories, the power of storytelling, the fact that the otters returned. When you look at WWF Hong Kong website, you're going to see the story of the otters. There have not been otters in 20, nearly 30 years. Not seen. And these, sorry about that, but these are nocturnal creatures. You have to have cameras, and they have had cameras for 30 years, not one. And then suddenly they showed up. But because people have pulled out most of the invasive species, the system has begun to recover, has come to breed. And then suddenly you see all of these, all of these uh, dragonflies. And it was phenomenal. But for me, the investment and that education, that bottom-up knowledge and that whole traditional system of, I am part of this and it is part of me, matters. Even when you're gone, that continues. So it's how do we keep the inspiration going? How do we share our stories? How do we check in? And also as a convention, you can go on our website. We have, and all of these are not our centers. These are centers of countries, centers of private people, centers of entities with wetland centers. We have over 350 of them around the world. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Just people talking about wetlands, people educating young people, people inspiring children. Of course, I'm not saying, of course, in some places it's very difficult because you see the degradation in your wetland, but it's inspiring young people. Why should I save this space? I was talking to a BBC presenter this morning, and he said to me, when I mentioned peatlands, he said, do you know about peatlands? And I said, let me tell you something. People have been wondering, these fires in Canada, oh my God, Canada is burning. Yes, Canada burnt because most of the peatlands were dry. Colleagues, for those of you that come from peatland countries, I'm sure you can educate your colleagues. When a peatland begins to burn, it's like a, a bomb. And it burns downwards. It burns days on. He said to me, Musonda, you know, after your, your talk about wetlands and why the climate conversation matters, etc., I'm going back to Ireland. To my, because my community has used so much peatland. We're talking about re-wetting. I said, oh, Jordan, that's exciting. Go back. Tell your community that they need to re-wet the wetlands because when they burn, it's not fun. And of course, the carbon that gets released is a whole different story. So that inspiration, how do you get young people involved in your local space? Because for me, my story goes back to my hometown. Because of what I saw as a kid, and what inspired me, of course, there are parts of the river that are not flowing in my hometown, and I'm upset by that. And I want to do something, and I go back every holiday this December, I'm going to be there, I want to do, I'm restoring a small wetland on my farm in, in Lusaka, because for me, it's personal. So for a lot of people, don't give up, they're inspired by what you've done. And it may seem challenging, but people are inspired, and let's go back and check in, you know, how is it going, tell us your stories. The power of storytelling is so critical. I don't want to take up much time. I think we can all agree that there will be many questions and I would love to listen to Ms. Robinson forever, but she deserves a much needed rest. So it is time to speak quite some time. So I know you have questions, but uh, you know, we we'll keep it for later, we can write to her and you know engage with her. First of all, can we have a big round for our class? Thank you. Thank you so much. We started this event in 1997. I don't know how many of you remember, Ruha Kisuza said that policy is the craft of disciplining power through good science. Right? And I think this, this presentation tells us how that can be done. So we have gone from a journey of questioning and querying, understanding and prodding the problem, to looking at inspiration that helps us to find solutions to them. So that has been an amazing journey. And especially I like the fact that you talked about your personal journey. Because tomorrow at 8.45, you all need to be here for a fascinating discussion on personal journeys and doing science. So please be here on time. And we will have a fantastic session as we did last year. And with that, we close the keynote session. Thank you so much, and thank you, Ms. Sundar.